Good evening, and welcome to the fifth in a series of readings and lectures on Mennonites' writing, mostly in Canada. I'm Hildy Fraze Thiessen, and tonight we turn our attention to literary representations of the Russian Mennonite diaspora, and to a question that never fails to fascinate me, how do works of fiction affect how we perceive the world we live in? More pointedly, in the context of what we've come to call the Russian Mennonite experience, how do the novels that presume to relate stories of the Russian Mennonite exodus shape the Russian Mennonites' thinking about where they've come from and who they are? Is there any limit to the potential versions of the same story? How can we characterize the various kinds of stories they tell? Well, I think our special guest this evening, Rob Zacharias, will address some of these things and related subjects. Before I introduce you to Rob, I'd like to tell you a little bit about next week and to alert those of you who have been regulars at this series at the week following next week, that is the week of February 20th, is the university's winter reading week. And there will be no event on the Wednesday evening. That would be February 22nd. So there's nothing happening here February 22nd. So next week, this will be an exceptional week for Grable and for this series. The college will be hosting Julius Spiker Kasdorf as the 2012 Rod and Lorna Sawatsi visiting lecturer, visiting scholar, I should say. Julia, a wonderful poet and an exceptionally thoughtful and engaging speaker, teaches creative writing and women's studies at Pennsylvania State University. She's a much loved poet, editor, and literary critic who has over the course of several years become a valued commentator also on the Martyr's Mirror. Julia Spiker Kasdorf, besides reading for the students at the college's community supper, will, as I've said on a few occasions, offer two poetry workshops on Thursday, February 16th for poets and would-be poets, details on a sheet available at the back, and anyone is eligible to sign up. Friday at noon, in a faculty forum session open to everyone, Julia will both offer comments on her new book of poetry and speculate on how, what she calls the old identity question, that is, what happens when we use the term Mennonite in a literary setting, for example, might evoke different responses in Canada and the USA. Her brief presentation in the, uh, on Friday at noon uh, is in the college boardroom and it is open to everyone. And on Friday evening, February 17th, that's next Friday, she will deliver the Sawatsky Lecture entitled Mightier Than the Sword, Martyr's Mirror in the New World, with a reception to follow. The venue, if you look on the website or in printed material, has been announced as the chapel, but the lecture on Friday will take place in the Great Hall at 7.30, so do plan to join us. As for her role in this series, next Wednesday evening, February 15th, Julia will take us on a tour through her career as a writer, a career marked at its outset by her award-winning first volume of poetry entitled Sleeping Preacher, which among other things cast light on the community of her ancestors in Big Valley, Pennsylvania, Amish ancestors. Her most recent collection of poems released late in 2011 bears the nervy title Poetry in America. She's bound to enthrall us all, so do come and hear her. Because this series has taken on the character of a bit of an ongoing conversation, even though I'm terribly sorry that because I have duties immediately after this, I'm not able to join the conversation in the back, I would like to address a few things that have come to my attention over the past week or two. First of all, a disclaimer for me. I misspoke last week when I said, and I quote, you'll find no reference to Low German in the work of Miriam Taves and other members of the younger generation who simply seldom encountered this language of Russian Mennonite village life. An unfortunate lapse on my part. What I meant to say was that Miriam Taves and other members of her generation did not grow up with Plattdeutsch and do not understand it. Nevertheless, as many of you know, there are indeed references to Low German, and not just a few in Miriam Taves. Uh, that language and the various things it might seem to represent clearly continues to inscribe itself on the Mennonite literary consciousness. My second observation, and there are just two now, uh, is obliquely related to the first and is a response to whispers that might sound something like this. <laughs> 
Why are we encountering so many Russian Mennonites in this series? What about the Swiss? Well, the simple answer is that the Russian Mennonites in Canada have produced a disproportionate amount of the literature we identify as Mennonite writing, just as Manitoba has produced most of the writers. Even our speaker tonight is from Manitoba, and I'm from Manitoba. If we broaden the categories with which I've been working here, that is the most recent 50 years of Mennonites writing in Canada, we could add, as Swiss Mennonite writers, Mabel Dunham, for example, whose most popular work, Trail of the Con Conestoga, first published in 1924, deals with the pioneer trek of Mennonites from Pennsylvania to Waterloo County. And some of you will remember my work with Paul Thiessen on the still unpublished novel by Ephraim Weber, entitled Aunt Rachel's Nieces, and we hope to prepare it for publication sometime. And there's a wonderful collection of stories that you should read if you never have called Mostly Country by Rosemary Deckert Nixon who grew up in a Swiss Mennonite community in Saskatchewan and who attended Grable some time back. And some of you, of course, might have other authors of Swiss heritage to mention. Another Grableite, Carrie Snyder, is launching her second book of fiction entitled The Juliet Stories in a few weeks. In fact, I've just confirmed with her that she will briefly introduce her brand new work to us by reading from it here on March 14th, the last evening of the series. She'll share the stage with Paul Thiessen, who will follow Carrie Snyder's reading that evening with a lecture on Miriam Taves and the trouble with Mennonite novels. We expect that copies of Carrie's book will be available for sale at the end of that session. Tonight, I'm pleased to introduce to you Rob Zacharias, who, like Carrie Snyder, is one of the wonderful, bright, and insightful young people I've come to know by virtue of my profession. I'm proud to say that both have been my students. Rob Zacharias completed his undergraduate studies in education at the University of Manitoba before moving to Ontario for graduate study in English. His achievements as a scholar have been recognized in the numerous major research grants and awards he has received, as well as in his recent appointment as associate editor of the Journal of Mennonite Studies. Last year, he completed a PhD in English at the Trans-Canada Institute at the University of Guelph with a dissertation on Russian Mennonite migration narratives in Canadian literature. He is now a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Diaspora and Transnational Studies at the University of Toronto, where he's working on the return journey in contemporary Canadian literature, including in fictions by Rudy Weeb and Sandra Birdsall. Rob's substantial record of publication includes numerous conference papers and articles in journals and books and several forthcoming, as well as a forthcoming book of essays co-edited with Canadian critic and theorist Smaro Camborelli. Tonight, he will introduce us to his work as a major young scholar in Mennonite writing. The title of his talk is Mennonite Literature as Communal Debate, Tracing the Collapse of the Russian Mennonite Commonwealth Through Canadian Literature. He's agreed to take questions after his lecture. I'm delighted to have him here. Please join me in welcoming him. So thank you for that, and uh, thank you for coming tonight. <clears throat> I have a bit, I'm still fighting a, a cold that I've had for a while, so I hope my voice will hold up throughout the evening here. Thank you, Hildy, for your uh, generous introduction. You know, when I, when I first saw the list of speakers uh, for the series after, sometime after I had agreed to speak on it, well, first I was thrilled thinking that I would have the opportunity to hear these people speak. My second thought was, I remember saying this to my wife, I think I'm the only person in this series who's going to need an introduction. <laughs> so, thank you for providing that for us tonight. And uh, thank you too for the invitation just to be a part of this series. Uh, it really is a pleasure to be here tonight, to be able to share some of my thoughts on this project, and an honor to be invited to be a part of this series, uh, particularly by you, Hildy, uh, given your long-standing position at the forefront of Canadian Mennonite criticism. My talk tonight will be around 45 to 50 minutes long, and it will be in two parts. 
I'll begin by discussing the rise and fall of what historians sometimes refer to as the Mennonite Commonwealth in southern Russia, now Ukraine, and look briefly at its relationship to writing in, Canadian, in Canada. There's actually quite a collection of novels that return to tell this story, and I think we can read these novels, or I'm going to suggest we can read these texts together side by side in juxtaposition as staging something of an ongoing debate about the nature of Mennonite cultural identity. Then for the second half of my talk, maybe 30 minutes or 25 minutes, I'm going to read a, give, a, give you a series of close readings of three of these novels, which, although they return to the same history, tell uh, very different stories. <clears throat> so we are trying a few things here, including this, uh, some technology. I hope that it works. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Voila. Is this the beginning? These are the opening words of John Weir's uh, 1995 experimental novel, Step. In Step, Weir tells the story of a young Mennonite man in Canada struggling to come to terms with the stories his father has told him of their family's life in the once prosperous Mennonite colonies of Ukraine. The novel opens with a passage that I'd like to quote at some length. It's from the young man's journal, and I think it serves well as an introduction to the topics that I want to address tonight. Is this the beginning? A story should have a beginning. Something must be planted, born. Is this how the words started, where the world began? My father's story, the things he told and told and told. Listen, he said. When I was young, he said. In Rusland, father's stories. By invoking and then inverting that most famous of first lines, that of Genesis, as a question, is this the beginning? By means of introducing us to his father's story, to the Mennonite colonies in Russia, Steps' opening passages, passage here anxiously positions this history as something like an origin story or mythological beginning for the Russian Mennonite community in Canada. In fact, by beginning in the beginning, and by emphasizing that biblical parallel by framing the history of the Mennonites in Canada as, quote, my father's story about where the world began, Step takes one further step, implying that the story of the Russian colonies, from the great height of their prosperity at the turn of the 20th century to the dramatic collapse in the aftermath of the Russian Revolution, has taken on almost the status of a supplementary scripture, as if it has become nearly as central to the identity of this deeply religious community as the biblical narrative itself. Weir's narrator, he's an, uh, an everyman character who has, who's left without a name. He's uh, deeply suspicious of his father's nostalgia. Determined to better understand his heritage, or what he calls his inheritance, he undertakes a large-scale research project into the Mennonites' time in, in Ukraine, and his findings become the novel's patchwork content. The novel itself is made up of several hundred short entries, such as this one. So this is the full first page. Uh, it's made up of several hundred entries with paragraphs taken out of history texts, just snippets of fairy tales, of extracts from found diaries, scraps of academic lectures, and so on and so on, all interspersed between his own journal and diary entries. Each entry sheds light on his father's history from just a slightly different perspective, each offering a slightly different version of the Mennonite past. As a novel with a host of competing and often contradictory perspectives that meld into the portrait of a conflicted community, Step structurally parallels the larger body of Canadian Mennonite fiction, which, as we'll see, has compulsively returned to tell and retell the dramatic events that culminated in the uh, mass migration of Mennonites into Canada during the 1920s. Now, my talk tonight is drawn from a dissertation that Hildy uh, was a part of, and for the sake of time, I need to talk in rather broad strokes today. But I do want to say at the outset that it's worth noting that in reality, things get a lot more complex, a lot more messy. Books don't like to be placed too closely into categories. They tend to seep out the bottom or pop out the top. And also, I've suggested that the story gets repeated in Mennonite literature in Canada, and it turns out that that notion of repetition itself is actually surprisingly tricky. What's more, as Madeleine Redekop reminded us last week, 
and Hildy reminded us tonight, that term Mennonite literature, the term Mennonite itself is a little co more complex than sometimes we let it stand as, and it's crossed by a series of parallels, sometimes complementary, sometimes competing histories, including, as you mentioned, the case of the Swiss Mennonites in Canada, or perhaps particularly relevant to my talk tonight, the Canadia Ruslander division. So I'm afraid I'm going to continue the tradition of this last couple of weeks. I'll also tell you that I don't know Plautich either, so I really am uh, <laughs> affirming your concerns earlier. My parents kept it as a, as a secret language, I was convinced. What's more, writing by Mennonites, or really writing by anybody for that matter, is always inflected and influenced by a host of competing forces, including the larger critical, political, and literary contexts of their production. So these are all the sort of complexities that start to make our discussion tonight get a little more complex. And I'm going to set them aside for tonight for the sake of time and clarity, uh, but we're not going to put them off the table. We'll just kind of put them aside and we should keep them in mind. <clears throat> so over the last couple of years, I've had the opportunity to speak about this topic, uh, as Hildy mentioned, uh, all across Canada, in the States, and recently in Poland. But I suspect I've never had the opportunity to speak to uh, an audience as knowledgeable as this one. Uh, and in fact, maybe before we go any further, I would like to get a sense of the knowledge or the experience that we have here in the room tonight. And so if I could just ask, just by a show of hands, how many of you are at least you know, somewhat familiar with the history of the Mennonites in, in Ukraine? Okay, <laughs> well, there we go. Uh, at, maybe since that's the case, how many of you have histories, family histories that cross or intersect with this story? Okay, so hopefully we'll have time to discuss at the end because I'm sure you help, will have much to say and I'd love to hear your thoughts on the project as a whole. For the two or three of you who uh, don't know the history, I want to run really quickly through it tonight and for the rest of us I uh, will just call it a review. This is the history that these novels return to in one way or another. <clears throat> Excuse me. At the end of the 20th century, the two major Mennonite colonies in present-day Ukraine, Kortitsa and Melachnia, had come to enjoy astonishing autonomy and prosperity. It's just north of the Black Sea, uh, so much south of Moscow there. Just over a century after first having arrived in the area at the invitation of Catherine the Great, these Mennonites had overcome initial hardships to develop an extensive, largely self-governing state within a state that historians often refer to as the Mennonite Commonwealth. Uh, due to state pressures, a growing landless class and or, depending on who you talk to, uh, religious disagreements, thousands of these Mennonites had immigrated to Canada during the 1870s, mostly to Manitoba and Saskatchewan, these being the uh, Canadiers. Those who remained constructed a remarkable social and economic infrastructure that went uh, well beyond that of the Russian state at the time. It included several hundred elementary schools, dozens of high schools that were there to facilitate a compulsory education program, as well as, well as teacher schools, trade schools, facilities for the deaf and elderly, a mental health facility, uh, you know, all sorts of uh, agricultural uh, factories and so on. There were credit unions, a bank, a system of taxation. It really was quite remarkable. The landless class continued to grow, but others had become fabulously wealthy and built some remarkable estates. A couple of archival pictures here. The Mennonites had insisted on strict divisions between themselves and their neighbors, however, and when late century programs of Russification created strong anti-foreigner sediment, the German-speaking colonists found themselves ready examples of a wealthy foreign bourgeoisie. With World War II and the Russian Revolution, the colonies became a part of a bloody battlefield for the control of Ukraine. And as the various state and anarchist forces swept repeatedly across the countryside where the colonies were located, hundreds of Mennonites were murdered. Like millions of others, over the coming decades, thousands of, Men of these Mennonites would be lost to labor camps and famines would threaten thousands more. Aided by the Mennonites who had earlier immigrated to North America, some 20,000 of these Mennonites managed to flee to Canada from Russia during the 1920s and often under the most dramatic of circumstances. It's worth noting, although in fact few of the novels that return to this history do, that the vast majority of Mennonites stayed behind, some 80,000. Now since the fall of the Iron Curtain, the uh, former colonies have, begun, have become a hot destination for heritage tourism among Mennonites. And this is something that I'm interested in for my next project, the, the postdoc. <clears throat> 
Actually, can I ask again, for, just by a show of hands, since so many people are familiar and so many people have this history, have any of you managed to make it back to the Ukraine to look at these colonies over the years? Okay, excellent. I actually had a chance uh, two years ago to go myself uh, with my father and to see what remains of that commonwealth. And we saw some of the most elaborate schools, like this one in Kortitsa, uh, and some of the largest industrial buildings, this one in Malachnia, that continue to be in use a century later, as well as the empty shells of some of the former estate homes. Time has changed the colonies, not only in terms of age and condition of the buildings, but also in terms of the iconography that decorates them. This is outside a, a, a former elementary school in the Malachnia. There are a number of monuments that have recently been erected to commemorate the Mennonites present in Ukraine, including this one, designed by Toronto designer Paul Epp, that I think very poignantly just demonstrates the very absent presence of the Mennonites in the area. But for me, one of the most striking images I saw on my trip was, uh, was this truck. It's not really a great picture, but you can see I'm taking it from the back seat here. This truck, and I just had over the top of the uh, blue back there, you can see uh, uh, the rounded edge of a, of a load of uh, these distinctive red Mennonite bricks that, the, that were used to build the Commonwealth. We saw numerous trucks like this and people on the side of the road with big wheelbarrows walking down the road. And just evidence of another building that has been taken apart and being, its bricks being reused. And we saw numerous you know, examples of sheds that have been built. Or I remember one house that was halfway built with red bricks then white bricks the rest of the way. And our, our uh, guide pointed it out. So the social, the economic, the religious life of the colonies were largely lost a century ago. And now the final remnants of the Commonwealth are literally, quite literally being taken apart brick by brick. <clears throat> In Canada, however, that world is being put back together, story by story. As Al Reimer puts it, those who lived through the collapse themselves, made it to Canada, became, quote, obsessed with the need to come to terms with that experience by writing about it. There's a vast collection of texts and writings that return to this period, including the innumerable diaries, journals, letters that I'm sure many of you have at home memoirs, some published, some unpublished, and of course a, ho and of course, a host of historical studies. There are some uh, remarkable pictorial uh, collections. I know uh, Forever, Forever Sunday, for, is it Forever Summer, Forever Sunday, for example. What interests me most, uh, and certainly tonight at least, is a large body of literature that returns to these events. Reimer reports that there's some 30 German novels that were written by emigres lamenting the loss of the Russian colonies. He identifies these as a literary tradition marked by what he calls the Heimat der Tang style of nostalgic recollection of and yearning for a culture and a way of life that had been innocently destroyed by evil forces beyond human comprehension, end quote. It's got such a flair. Scholars like Harry Lowen have constructed a critical genealogy that positions the retelling of the Russian experience as marking the actual birth of Mennonite literary culture. I'm quoting him here. When the Mennonites lived securely in Prussia and Russia for almost 300 years, they wrote next to no creative works, he reports. But when their pasts vanished almost overnight, their present bleak and dismal, their future unknown to them, they abruptly began to write. Out of this chaotic and hopeless situation, he declares, Mennonite literature was born. Reimer, among others, agrees, writing, quote, the destruction of the Mennonite Commonwealth shocked the Mennonite literary imagination into life, end quote. These early writers rose primarily in German and were mostly recording the traumas that they themselves had lived through or offering nostalgic laments for the loss of a homeland, such as Arnold Dix lost in the steppe. Importantly, however, there's a long list of authors who have returned more recently to retell these stories in English, writing not as participants in the class, but as members of a community in which these stories and this history continues to hold a privileged position. Novels like John Weir's Step that I already introduced you to, Blue, uh, Rudy Weeb's Blue Mountains of China, uh, Barbara Smucker's Days of Terror, Al Reimer's My Harp is Turned to Mourning, Sandra Birdsell's The Ruslander, its sequel, Children of the Day, uh, the three books of Janice Stick's Storm Trilogy, Calm Before the Storm, Eye of the Storm, and Out of the Storm, Annie Jacobson's 
Watermelon Syrup, and there's others. All these novels retell the events of the Russian experience as central elements of their narratives. And they've kept this story circulating in Canadian literature over the past 30 years or so. The Toronto writer Anne Conrad captures something of the urgency that permeates many of these retellings in the staccato sentences with which she closed a recent article. The article was entitled, Why the Soviet Mennonite Story Remains Unfinished. The closing sentences are, the story is unfinished, period, it matters, period. It matters, of course, because of the important history that it recounts. But also, I want to suggest, because of the role that such retellings play as part of the larger negotiation of cultural identity. We know the power of literature to spark debate. We can just think back to Rudy Weeb's publication of uh, Peace Shall Destroy Many and the debate uh, that emerged out of that event. But rather than looking at a single provocative text, and there's been a number of them over the years, what I'm interested in here is the particular way in which a variety of novels, all telling that quote-unquote same story, can come to function as a shared venue for discussion or communal debate. In his influential study, Global Diasporas, the sociologist Robin Cohen found that many migrant communities are deeply marked by what he describes as the quote, unambiguously shocking episodes in their history that have led to their dispersion, end quote. He refers to these key moments as communities break events. And he goes on to argue that the remembering of such events blur history and myth as they, as they come to take on ever more important roles in the collective memory of their communities. He runs through a number of examples using uh, the Babylon for the Jews, uh, Irish, the potato famine for the Irish, and so on. And he does mention the Mennonites at one point. Uh, he kind of gets it wrong. But anyways, he does mention them. As a literary critic, my argument is that the Russian Mennonite experience has, in the cultural production that, of that community in Canada, been crystallized as one of these break events. Much like the earlier martyr narratives, it's become one of the fixed points in the constellation of their cultural identity. Now, at times, the debate that swirls around this fixed point is quite explicit, such as when, midway through his novel Step, Weir restages a scene from Arnold Dick's Lost in the Step, and yet he fills in a scathing critique of the way in which the Mennonites in Ukraine were treating their non-Mennonite neighbors. More often, however, this debate is uh, less obvious. If the central uh, story of each of these novels is the same, that they each recount the last days of the colonies, the Commonwealth's collapse, and the dispersal of the Mennonites around the globe, we know, of course, that the stories that they tell are never quite the same. Each retelling, both affirming the importance of the dispersal narrative and yet rewriting it, adding to it, deleting from it, emphasizing some things, erasing others. And thus, I think, debating the history of the community and implicitly what we value or what we ought to value in the present. As the sociologist Louis Koza writes about the function of collective memory, quote, the present generation may rewrite history, but it doesn't write on a blank page, end quote. The many novels retelling this history overlap, I think, into something like a, a cultural palimpsest, and it requires us to read widely across the larger collection of novels for the discussion and the debate to sort of rise to the surface. Now, of course, there's other arenas and avenues or places where these debates can take place. Historians can and have argued about the effectiveness of the self-defense units, for example, uh, and theologians can and have debated whether they were justified. But part of my argument here is that Mennonite literature in Canada is particularly well suited for a communal debate as a result of its remarkable breadth and quality, what critics sometimes refer to as the Mennonite miracle. In fact, Hilde Fraze Thiessen has recently suggested that today, the voices of Mennonite creative writers are, quote, possibly more widely listened to than, the, than those of any other thinkers to whom the uh, Mennonite community may lay claim, end quote. Elsewhere, she goes further, stating more confidently that literary authors have become the dominant forces shaping, quote, the new cultural memory of Mennonites, end quote. Others seem to agree. In reviewing Al Reimer's novel, My Harp is Turned to Mourning, for example, Irvin Beck writes that the novel, quote, will probably shape our knowledge of the Russian Mennonite history for many years to come, since more Mennonites will read and believe this novel than they will scholarly books or Mennonite quarterly review articles on the subject, end quote. The historian John B. Taves also celebrated Reimer's novel as a painless history lesson, those are his words, 
And he envisions a scenario in which each of his, where, which his history students read the novel and unanimously decide it to be entirely accurate. He can't stop himself from adding, quote, and where will that leave us historians? <laughs> End quote. So over the next half hour, I want to linger over three strains of emphasis that I think we can find among the many novels that return to this history and take a brief look at one novel that represents each. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to try and just focus on a particular moment or aspect of each text as a way to sort of uh, enter into unpacking what's at stake in their uh, individual representations of the Commonwealth. <clears throat> Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. Perhaps not surprisingly, <clears throat> one of the main ways or common ways in which the Russian experience gets presented is in something we might call the theological stream, in which the history is told with an emphasis on exploring the religious or at least the theological uh, implications that it holds for the community. And note here, I'm not referring to novels that simply record or seek to comment on religious life in the colonies. One would think that any novel returning to this history would need to do that much. But rather those texts that actively shape the representation of this past in accordance with a larger theological argument. The most compelling examples of the theological strange, strain, in which I'm including Al Reimer's 1985 novel, My Harp is Turned to Mourning, engage in a serious and sometimes difficult theological reflection on the meaning of the Russian experience. Reimer's novel will be my first tonight. It tells the story of the young Wilhelm Fast, an aspiring artist who becomes a village teacher in the Malachnia colony just before the, minute, the Commonwealth's collapse. And it follows him through the various trials and tribulations that his family and he himself face during the chaos in which he loses his father, both brothers, his in-laws, and his pregnant, worth, uh, pregnant first wife before he manages to flee to Canada. <clears throat> Reimer's novel is, I think, exemplary of the theological strain in that it insists on a theological framework for understanding the Russian experience, but it eschews simplistic or dogmatic answers to the difficult qu theological question it raises. Indeed, while we could think of some other examples in the theological strain that are largely celebratory, Reimer's novel levels a stinging critique of the Mennonites' long cherished principle of separation for the world, for example, and offers unflinchingly critical portraits of both the material inequities that characterize the Mennonite colonies and the vapid religious rhetoric that sometimes would enable it. The novel's not perfect, it's certainly not free of didacticism, but two of its, most, two, two of its explicitly religious subplots the life of the former failed church reformer, old Daniel Fast, and the charismatic evangelist, Erdman Lepp, uh, show the power and promise of religious faith as deeply intertwined with the attendant dangers of fanaticism and corruption. If you look kind of across the wider uh, texts, literary and non-literary, that return to this story, there are two biblical narratives that are commonly invoked for the 1920s uh, migration as a as sort of a parallel. One being the Jewish exodus from Egypt, invoked explicitly in some of the earlier uh, historical studies, and the other being the persecution of Job. Both these parallels uh, are somewhat problematic when we start to push on them too much, but it's the story of Job that's most commonly adopted by novelists, including Reimer as flagged by his title, which many of you will recognize coming from the book of Job. Harp is unique, however, in its use of the Job parallel because it doesn't use it simply to establish the Mennonite faith as part of the historical context for the narrative, as I'd say Birdsell does in the Ruslander, for example, nor is an appeal to suggest the Mennonites were largely blameless in God's sight, as Janice Dick does in her Storm series. Instead, Reimer allows the Job narrative to both affirm the community's theological origins or foundations and to level a critique of its failures to live up to them. It may, not, it may be surprising, for example, that the clearest connection that, uh, between Job and the Mennonites in Harp are not with those caught in the, Menon, in the Commonwealth's collapse at all, but with an earlier collapse, that of the theological ideals that were meant to animate the community. The novel's titular reference to Job, for example, comes some 70 years before the Russian Revolution and Daniel Fast's failed efforts at church reforms, Insisting that the doctrine of separation of the world is no guarantees against its lures, Daniel anticipates the collapse of the colony shortly before his arrival in Russia 
after his arrival in Russia in the late 1800s. Quote, perhaps our big mistake right from the start was to think that we could live in our little world like ducks on a pond, he muses, then comparing his spiritual suffering to that of Job. We separated ourselves from the world so we could live for him, not so we could build bigger and richer estates. Like Job's, my harp is turned to mourning. It's a terrible thing to fall in the hands of, living, of the living God. Ah, heavenly Father, thy terrible loving will be done. The passage crystallizes for me the novel's larger theological interpretation of the history it's representing, which I think advocates a resignation to God's terrible loving will. Earlier, Daniel preaches, I think in a particularly didactic moment in the book, Daniel preaches a sermon on what he calls the, quote, Anabaptist aim of achieving Galassenheit, or a serene self-surrender to the resignation of God's will, end quote. And he notes that, quote, what has not been ground or crushed is husk only fit for swine, end quote. And he, you know, quotes, uh, grapes have to be crushed to make wine and these sorts of thoughts. This theological claim is affirmed over and again by the larger text in Daniel's sermons, in its larger critiques of the doctrine of separation and of their disproportional, Mennonites' disproportional wealth, their ill-fated self-defense units, and so on. And I think most fully in its portrayal of the evangelist, Urban Lepp. <clears throat> I should ask, is, is, this talk is full of spoilers, but how many of you have read or are familiar with My Harp is Turned to Morning? Good, good, so I won't be spoiling it for all of you. Lep, you may recall, begins the novel as a deeply unsympathetic, unsympathetic character. He's bombastic, he's a bully to children, uh, he's a womanizer. Uh, but by the novel's close, however, he manages to emerge, as Giesbrecht writes, quote, as a towering figure of indomitable faith. Of the major characters of the novel, Lep alone refuses to respond to the violence around him with violence of his own. Indeed, in the climax of the novel, or a passage that many critics have identified as its strongest, even Machno himself is shown to respect Lep's pacifism, lets him go with a whipping. His reward, however, is not the chance to emigrate to Canada and to safety, but rather the opportunity to continue his evangelism under even more trying conditions. Even as the other major characters in the novel have fled the country and are beginning to climb the social ladder elsewhere, Wilhelm and his wife, for example, have succeeded in farmers as farmers in Saskatchewan are now moving, and are now moving to Winnipeg to restart their careers and the arts. The novel takes its final three pages to present Lep as a portrait of suffering faith. Exiled to the worst of the Soviet punishment camps, we are told he continues to, pro quote, preach the love of Christ and the peace that passes all understanding. He has become, we are assured, a, quote, living symbol of hope. In its affirmation of Lep's suffering faith, the novel fo follows the Job paradigm to a controversial conclusion, questioning the theological uh, justification for the migration itself, implying that, far from being an answer from God, the mass flight may not have been in keeping with what Daniel Fast names the Anabaptist aim of Galassenheit. Now, this is not to say that the novel's use of Job to present this theology is entirely consistent or unproblematic. In emphasizing Mennonite decadence and hypocrisy, and in criticizing the Mennonite practice of separating themselves from the world, Reimer's novel also adopts a series of material and political explanations for the violence of the Commonwealth's collapse. And in this, he's departing strongly from the Job paradigm. In Job, it's, it's explicitly not a punishment that, that, uh, for Job's suffering. Nonetheless, the point is not, at least not for me or for us here tonight, to argue over the ultimate correctness of the novel's theology, but simply to recognize that in Harp, Reimer is positing a most complex and compelling theological interpretation of the Russian experience. And yet, and yet even as the novel explicitly questions the theology of separation from the world, it's a narrow focus on the suffering of the Mennonites as a distinct community of believers in this case, locates it firmly within the larger overarching Mennonite narrative, what John Ruth has called the, the Mennonite story in, in, in general, as opposed to the more general Christian or historical narratives of the period. And now I wanna set Reimer's novel aside and move on to a text that shows just how quickly 
This insistence upon the Mennonites' distinctiveness can become a straightforward narrative of ethnic identity. <clears throat> Mennonite ethnicity. The issue that Hilde Frey's Thiessen has gone on record as saying it's a quagmire into which she has no desire to wade. <laughs> Indeed, few issues have been as contentious in Mennonite scholarship over the years as the problem of Mennonite ethnicity, whether such a thing exists, whether it ought to exist, and so on. A part of my larger project is to suggest that the label of ethnic writing as it has been applied to Mennonite writing in Canada as a whole, has been misleading and problematic. But the work of Arnold Dick demonstrates that the exaltation of ethnic origins, along with attendant dreams of cultural purity, are not always unwelcome to our authors. Dick's uh, collected volumes, collected, the, the collected, his collected works, as to say, was just published, were just published in, I think, four or five volumes. He's a, he was a he published widely, very widely, but he only wrote one novel, and that's Lost in the Steppe. Lost tells the story of Hans Taves, a young child growing up in a Mennonite village in Ukraine during the height of the Commonwealth's golden years. These should become familiar stories now. In five parts that were originally published as Verloren in der Steppe between 1944 and 1948, the novel traces Hans's personal, artistic, and educational development while meticulously detailing the minutia of uh, the colony's edu uh, agricultural world. Hans's unfailingly kind and honest parents alternate between being proud and excited about his educational and artistic achievements and being worried that these very achievements will take them away from him. And in fact, at the novel's close, young Hans is leaving his small village for Kortitsa, the Mennonite urban center, where he will continue his education. Although the novel is uh, traditionally considered a Bildungsroman, or a coming-of-age story, in truth, Hans's development is almost completely overshadowed, I'd say, by the novel's loving portrait of Mennonite life in Russia. In fact, one could argue that the primary protagonist of the novel is the Commonwealth itself, the novel serving as a biography of a distinct people just on the verge of coming into their own as a cultural community, with Hans the attractive embodiment of the community's artistic and intellectual potential. Dick offers an exhaustively detailed portrait of the re of rep or representation of Hochfeld, the Mennonite village of Hans's formative years. How many people are familiar with, um, with Lost in the Steppe? A few less, okay. It's a fascinating read. It's, it's hard to get your hands on a copy actually now, but it is worth doing. The novel, especially the first three books, just revels in the details of that world, overloading the narrative with a comprehensive description of the Mennonites' physical and social world, all illustrated by dozens of Dick's own sketches. There is, oh sorry, I should say, no aspect of colony life is too mundane to be featured prominently. There is, for example, a lengthy description of a milk bench and a milk rod that are in, his, in Hans's house. And of course, it comes complete with two illustrations. In fact, I thought just to help us get a sense of what the first couple of books of the uh, collection, it's five books put together, uh, look like, I'd walk you through the first three or first two of the first three chapters, I think chapter two and chapter three. They're short chapters, and this is indicative of sort of the first couple of books in the series. Here we have chapter two of book one, the small room. There's a drawing of a small room. We have a milk rod, we have the critical clock, of course. And then we have a floor plan of Hans's houses. Then we have chapter three, the corner room, which we see a picture of Hans with his grandmother, another drawing of the room, and a few more illustrations of typical things in the, to be found in the house. It goes room by room, and then it goes to the farm, and then it goes to the larger village. And it goes to the social life, talks about the pig killings and the, and the various uh, traditions in the community. The use of historical details like this to construct a past reality is not entirely unique to Lost or to the narrative of ethnicity. My Harp is Turned to Mourning, for example, is also characterized by a plethora of historical detail. No sketches, though. The difference is that where Harp weaves this mass of details into a narrative progression precisely in order to draw out a theological argument, in Lost, these details are, at least in the first couple of books, I would say, the, folk, the reason of the book itself. 
When we recall that the novel was originally published in serial form, it becomes clear that by the time Dick was publishing the fourth and fifth books of the volume, his readers weren't really purchasing a novel at all. What they had on their shelves was an 80-page encyclopedia, detailing and celebrating life in the Commonwealth. It's really a, a, a testament to Dick's abilities as a writer that this encyclopedic or episodic structure uh, doesn't unravel the narrative. His use of Hans's naive perspective on that world keeps the text fresh and engaging throughout. And yet, for all its careful cataloging of both the physical and social world of the Mennonites, Lost somehow manages to forget their faith. In stark contrast to literally every other novel and almost every other writing that I've read on this period, Lost characters are never shown to be reading the Bible, praying, entering a church. There's no mention of the early Anabaptists or the denominational schisms so prominent during the period in which the novel is set. There's no discussion of the morality of the community's wealth or questions about the self-defense units. In fact, there's only one extended discussion of Mennonites as Christians in the text, and it comes in a heavily racialized debate between a Jewish peddler and Hans's father. And it serves, like many of the uh, interactions between Mennonites and their neighbors in the text, in order to de demonstrate the distinctiveness of the Mennonites. By removing the element of religion from the Mennonite society altogether, the, the uh, community's cohesiveness, all those details, are left to be bound together and attributed entirely to its cultural, its linguistic, and its kinship ties, or in other words, ethnic elements. Stripped of its theological underpinnings, in Lost, the religious ideal of remaining separate from the world becomes an affirmation of the distinctiveness of the Mennonites as a distinct, unique people, or a Germanic Volk. Uh, when it maps the Mennonites' interactions with their neighbors, for example, when it notes uh, business dealing with traveling Jews who come into Hans's house for the week and so on, or when it talks about the series of Ukrainian, or as he calls them throughout, little Russian teachers in the village, Lost carefully polices the, dis the distinctions between these villages, or these communities, always using the otherness of those others to affirm the unamb unambiguously Germanic Mennonite identity. In fact, uh, Dick uses the term German rather than Mennonite throughout the book. And when Hans dreams of the perfect commonwealth, as he does numerous times through the text, he does so in starkly biological terms. Quote, what if all these villages were German like Hochfeld? He asks wistfully, and he goes on to imagine the, uh, the superintendent with blonde hair and the, and the businessman with blue eyes and so on. Later he says, blonde hair, blue eyes, fair skin. That's the way they may look. Even when his friends challenge him on this, it only serves to affirm the novel's ethnic logic. You mean everybody German, Isaac, Isaac asks him? And where would we get the workers? Dick's novel is not without empathy for the difficulties faced by the Russians and Ukrainians with whom the Mennonites interact. It's particularly sympathetic to the plight of the Ukrainian teachers on the colony and having to put up with the young children, Mennonite children. Nor is it without criticism for, of the many Mennonites who consider themselves superior to their neighbors. But its critique of the Mennonites is fully contained with, as the foibles of a distinct German people much like its empathy for the neighbors, is always managed to maintain a clear distance between them and the Mennonites. However unfortunate this distance may be, the narrator tells us on more than one occasion that, quote, it couldn't be otherwise, end quote. While the Germanic, German Mennonite world here might be located in a larger, more multi-ethnic world, it's certainly not of it. <clears throat> I want to suggest that this portrait of a Mennonite German homeland is supported by the episodic encyclopedic structure of the novel's earlier books, you know, the stories where there's so many pictures and so on. Throughout the novel, but especially in the last two books, there are indications of a rising tension on the colonies, with the narrative repeating flashing, repeatedly suddenly flashing forward to indicate the horror that is awaiting the colonists. So uh, Hans is describing a, a farm, for example, and he'll say, all these barns would burn when the rest of Russia burned. But nobody thinks of that now. Or he'll be describing a, a farm animals, and he'll say, he'll say, this horse was requisitioned during the war, but right now it's Hans's favorite, and so on. <clears throat> 
this sort of thing. And yet, despite the fact that the author, this, is, this author actually personally lived through the collapse of the Commonwealth, Reimer reports that Dick actually came face to face with Machno at one point. The story of loss stops prior to the First World War. What's interesting to me is not just that it covers a slightly different time frame than the no other novels in, this, in uh, returning to this history, but rather that it seems to want to place that Commonwealth outside of time altogether. In fact, while uh, novels like uh, Reimer's Harp often use chapter by chapter uh, date lines to carefully historicize their portraits of the Commonwealth, it's very common to have Malachnia, November 13th, 1917, like very specific references to the date and time so that we're able to historicize the novels. Lost in a Step is, by contrast and remarkably, a historical novel without a single specific mention of calendar time. Only the passing of the seasons, the occasional reference to the month of the action, and Hans's progression through the grades of elementary school mark the passage of time in the text. In fact, even the clocks don't work in the novel. Hans's brother has a blind watch, they're called it just for play. He, and he tries but fails to build a clock for the house. There are, I think as you saw, one of them, three Kroger clocks in the house, and they're told, we're told they're important, but whenever Hans tries to count along with them, we're told he, quote, oh, gets probably as far as 30, and suddenly all is gone. Pendulum, clock, also the number. By invoking the collapse that we know, so that we know what's coming, but never letting it arrive, and by erasing specific mentions to dates or times, Lost creates a sort of temporal suspension for its detailed description of the Commonwealth. Not surprisingly, it's also the only novel telling this history that I'm aware of that resent, represents its entire history or entire narrative in the present tense. So Hans is doing this, we are seeing this, whereas most novels will say, Wilhelm did this, this, what, this is what happened. So it's placing us back at the moment of its happening. It's working to place the reader, I think, back into an eternal present of the Commonwealth. I think we can understand this attempt to remain in an eternal present as an effort to fabricate what Michel Foucault has called the timeless and essential secret of an originary moment. An attempt to, quote, capture the exact essence of things, their purest possibilities, and their carefully protected identities, end quote. Consider in this light Victor Peter's review of the novel, in which he claimed, and this is really uh, symptomatic of or not indicative, that's the word I'm looking for, typical, there we go, of many of the reviews of the novel when it was republished in 1974. He says the novel, quote, pulsates with the life of a world, a Mennonite world, which has forever receded beyond the horizon of time, where life was good, life was full, and life had meaning. Without making any reference to a Mennonite past that moves beyond their first arrival in Russia, and with an imminent collapse that never arrives, and with a lack of time or temporal markers, this detailed construction of a distinct Germanic people is preserved within this timeless temporality, a Mennonite world in which life is good and full, but which has receded beyond the horizon of time. This, I think, is what characterizes Dick's efforts to construct the Commonwealth as a mythical pastoral origin of an ethnic community. Is this the beginning where the world began? asks Weir's narrator at the start of Step. The answer offered by Lost is why, yes. <laughs> yes, it is. Now, let's turn to the third and final novel that I want to talk about this evening, where Reimer's harp traces its characters through the collapse of the Commonwealth, and Dick's Lost never manages to get there at all. Sandra Birdsill's 2001 novel, The Ruslander, begins with it. Can I ask again, how many people are familiar with uh, Sandra's novel? Okay, of course. <coughs> then you'll know that the novel opens with a newspaper article revealing that 11 of the novel's main characters will die in a mass murder on a Mennonite estate in southern Russia on November 11th, 1917. Here we have an example of the dating and the history. A short paragraph below the list of victims, which I've cut off here, explains the circumstances. The 11 were found in the yard of Abraham Suderman's large estate, either shot or with their throats slit. 
the estate owner himself was decapitated. The larger novel, which begins several pages later, sets out to tell this story of the massacre from the perspective of the elderly Catherine or Katya Vogt, one of its few survivors. From the comfort of her Canadian retirement home some 80 years after she fled the colonies, Katya recounts for the first time the story of her family's massacre at the request of one Ernest Unger, a young Mennonite man who is traveling the country recording Ruslanda stories for the Mennonite Heritage Center in Saskatchewan. In its two-part structure, the novel repeats this single story with a difference. Catch is deeply personal, deeply subjective, and ultimately partial account, challenging the detailed but detached account offered by the opening newspaper clipping. In this decision to present the Russian Mennonite experience through the memory of a single character, the novel shifts the historical shifts away from a historical claim, i.e., this is how it was, towards a per psychological one, that is, this is how I remember it. If, as I have suggested, the theological folk narrative focuses on the import of the Russian experience for the Mennonites as a community of faith, and the ethnic narrative displaces that violence into an imminent but ever deferred future as a, mean of meaning, as a means excuse me, of constructing an originary moment for a community as a distinct ethnicity. The Ruslander can be read as a trauma narrative where the violence of the Russian experience is examined for its impact on the individual within that community. That brief newspaper article with which Birdsell opens her novel establishes the larger collective experience of the massacre as the context, or I think uh, more accurately we could say as the foil for Katya's personal narrative, as well as gives us an idea, kind of hints about the shape of the community into which Katya is born. Benedict Anderson has identified the newspaper as a primary medium for the construction of imagined communities, and the German language uh, header newspaper article that opens the novel both addresses and works to construct a very particular form of community. The novel, the, the article's brevity, it's just a page long, suggests a collection of readers who are familiar with the geo and political contexts. While its adjectives assume a particular set of political and uh, religious sympathies. So for example, uh, the Mennonites are described as being having been piteously slain by bandits. Although the article leaves both the perpetrators and the survivors unnamed, it does manage to identify both the church elder who, for, who announced the massacre and the church where, where the news was broken, reminding its readers of a theological frame through which the violence can be understood. This, in fact, I think is indicative of the function of religion throughout the novel, where it is emphasized as the primary context, a class-inflected, uh, heavily gendered, sometimes nurturing, but often homogenizing and limiting force through which Katya must negotiate her traumatic, her traumatic experience. But the story that's told in that newspaper article, the theological, the communal one, is not the story being told by the Ruslander. In a talk here at Conrad Grable several years ago, Birdsell explained her decision to begin the novel by announcing the death of many of its main characters it was made as a way to encourage readers to attend more closely to the particularities of the lives that are being represented. Lives, she said, which often blur into the background in the many retellings of the story. You know, she says, quote, I've read so many accounts of the sufferings that I began to feel numbed by them. Soon they all began to sound the same. And I didn't want the reader to forget for a moment that these people would be gone, and therefore to pay attention to their lives, to the smallest details that make them unique. By using this graphic violence to emphasize the specificity, specificity of the narrative, Birdsell invites readers to for a moment set aside our generalized claims of the effect upon or the lessons of the collapse for this larger amorphous Mennonite world and reconsider instead its impact upon the individuals who survived its horror, or as the case may be, who didn't survive. I think this desire to focus on the individual within the community, rather than the individual as a representative of the community, is reflected in Katya's refusal to, show, to share her story for some 70 years, as she withheld it from curious community members in Russia, even from her own family in Canada saying simply that she doesn't want, quote, the spirits of the story to pollute the air, end quote. Silence, of course, is a common response to trauma, and it has a long and gendered history 
in the Mennonite tradition as well. These are points that the novel makes clear. Uh, but even when she does finally tell her story, she refuses to mention or identify even one of her 73 descendants in Canada, making it an omission from the story that echoes her expressed desire to keep them separate from the trauma of her past. In fact, she's openly dismissive of her grandchildren's attempts to connect themselves with her story, noting that the photographs of her life in Russia have been taken from her over the years by those she calls the, quote, offspring of her children, not grandchildren, but her offspring of her children, suddenly wanting to know their heritage, wanting to be more than Canadian fair-skinned people. Katya scoffs that her grandchildren are instrumentalizing her past out of what she calls their own desire to, quote, be more exotic. Katya's frustrations with her grandchildren's attempts to claim her past not only indirectly adds Birdsell's voice to the many writers who have critiqued the exoticism implicit in the Canadian multicultural ideal, but it also echoes Dominic Lecapre's warning that, quote, the appropriation of particular traumas by those who did not experience them, typically in a moment of identity formation, often results in the invidious and ideological use of traumatic events as symbolic capital. <coughs> so this is a different story indeed. There is a sense, however, that it's impossible to attend to the individual without also attending to the context of her experience. And despite the novel's insistence on the specificity of, her, of Katya's traumatic experience, it does not attempt to fully resolve the tension between the collective and the individual narratives that it poses. Not only does Birdsell begin the novel with that most communal of documents, the newspaper, but her decision to have Katya recount her story to Ernest Unger for the archives ensures that her deeply personal narrative is never free from the specter of its communal reception. Specter is too big of a word, by the possibility of its communal reception. If, as Jacques Derrida insists in archive fever, the archive, quote, marks that institutional passage from the private to the public, Katya's own account is, as we would expect, unavoidably marked by this passage. Not only does she share her own story for the archives, we learn, as she concedes, that she actually learned the details about her family's murder through her own archival research. It turns out she and her sister were hiding during the, the violence, and she had to go to the archives herself to read about it to find out what happened. We saw a clear example of the archival, or we might call it the encyclopedic urge in Lost, in Lost, where Dar Arnold Dick made an effort to amass that collection of documents and details as an evident of a Mennonite peoplehood. But, but Birdsell's novel explicitly takes that archival urge, that, that, uh, that deep desire to remember as much as possible as a trope in itself, calling it to our attention, troubling its structure, and inviting a consideration of its implications. When, near the end of the novel, Unger lists a long series of statistics about the number and the location of the dead. Katya recognize, recognizes the pull in the community that's implicit in this gesture, and she sees it as a threat for her own story. She looks to uh, refuse it. He had been to the archives, she thinks to herself. He had read the stories which, in the end, all sound the same. Given that Katya has just finished recording her own story for the archives, her comment reminds us of the ways in which communal narratives seem to depersonalize the history they mobilize in the name of collective identity. I think what's particularly fascinating is the way that the novel tries to pull the reader into this equation. So the text includes recipes, letters, newspaper clippings, and I'd say the novel is itself, implicitly at least, on the archivist's tape. So the readers find themselves flipping through these documents as if they too are sitting in an archive. This is something the American issue uh, edition of the novel makes, kind of exaggerates. It's, it's just simply called Katya. And if you open up the, the first pages of the uh, American edition, there is that uh, newspaper article, but it's stylized. It has the gothic print and everything as if it's uh, uh, you know, clipped out of a newspaper. And then you turn the page and there's some maps giving you a sense of, okay, here it is. So it has a sense of, you know, you're flipping through the box in the archives. <coughs> 
This gesture is made explicit in an important closing moment when Katya suddenly turns the focus of the narrative onto the archivist, or onto the archivist himself. Just what do you hope to get from my, to get from my story? She asks, a question that extends beyond the pages of the text towards us, the novel's readers. His answer, he says he's collecting stories of the Ruslanders told in their own voices for future generations to come and listen to, reveals that what he hopes to get out of his story, it turns out, is not just a story at all, but a community, a community of readers that stretches across generations. Wurzel's beautiful, uh, uh, haunting text is itself caught within this similar tension, for there's a way in which even an interrogation of the function of communal narratives cannot help but affirm it. For to retell the story in any way is to affirm that it's relevance to the larger community. It's a point that's made uh, perhaps more forcibly in some of the meta-narrative retellings of, this, of the Russian experience, like John Weir's Step, where for all the narrator's blustering at the end of the novel about how he's exposed the gaps and the falsehoods in his father's story, in the end, his journal retells that same story again, just from a different view and so affirms its importance to the community anew. Turns out you can't really write your way out of a communal story. So, is this the end? We know that the differences in the various retellings of this key history are less indicative of some shifts in the past than they are of a shift of what we value in the present. And of course, what we ought to value in the present is a matter of up for some debate. At the beginning of my talk, I noted that John Weir's step opens with that question, is this the beginning? In the closing pages of the novel, his narrator offers an answer. Stories don't begin and they never end, he writes in his diary, and a few pages later continues. In fact, nothing ever ends, and I hope it stays that way. A story once started runs in all directions, takes a million shapes. It lives in the blood and in the bone, in mind and in matter. One story builds another story. Let's hope this is so. Thank you. Maybe while you're formulating your questions, I, it's something I had to take out and I just wanted to put back in so badly, I'll take, the, take that moment of silence as an opportunity to do it. One of the things that's, I think, most interesting for me about the repetition of this story is not just that so many novelists have returned to tell that story, but those who have returned to tell that story seem to have trouble letting it go as well. So Sandra Birdsill, after writing Ruslander, a couple of years later came out with Children of the which is a continuation of Katya and her sister's story. It's not unusual to write a sequel, of course, but Arnold Dick and Al Reimer, both of whom we discussed today, also returned to their novels decades after they originally published it to add additional chapters. So Arnold Dick's chapter uh, was only recently published in Germany for the first time. Uh, it's not translated yet. Uh, but what's interesting is it tells the story of the violence. It starts with a date and a time, and it goes straight to the violence. That his other novel just so completely defers. Similarly, Al Reimer's uh, addition to his story was recently published in a, in a collection of stories, uh, When War Comes to Kleindarp, I think. Uh, and the story is called Mennonite Fireburns. And it picks up the story of Wilhelm Fast when he got to Winnipeg, goes to, I think he goes to Steinbach or something. And uh, it shows him interacting with the Canadiers and, and nurturing uh, a, a new Mennonite uh, artistic identity. And really, I think in many ways, affirms the migration narrative that his earlier novel calls into question. And they're not the only ones. I think uh, Rudy Weeb's Blue Mountains of China was published in 1970. Two years ago, in 2010, when he published his collected short fiction, he added another chapter to the Blue Mountains of China and called it titled, I think, Frozen the Oz the Frozen in the ocean, oh, I'm getting it wrong. Do you remember? Okay. Anyways, you'll have to trust me. Uh, and in it, 
uh, one of the main characters from Blue Mountains of China returns to the colonies walking along and, and running into, I won't ruin it for you if you haven't read it. Uh, but again, we have this, these individual authors who have written their stories and decades later find, the, find themselves unable to resist the urge to go back and comment on it. I just found that, I find that's really indicative of the power of this story in the larger uh, writing community. Yeah, please. Um, it's always been interesting to me that uh, Al Reimer, a Canadier, mm. felt compelled to write yeah, that's right. Um, and the other interesting thing I just noticed uh, from your, when you talk about Brussels is her, her title is a communal title, Ruslender. It's not the story of Russia. But did you say the American version has the individual? Yeah, it's not interesting. Yeah. It is interesting. It is, of course, the Ruslender. It is the uh, definite article which, you know, now. Uh, the has a lot it's plural. Plural. Oh, look at this. That's a plural. Well, I have to make that change <laughs> in, the, in the document. That's fascinating. Okay. So it is interesting that she calls up that sort of uh, collective identity, which in fact she does exactly the same thing in that opening newspaper article, calls up the communal and then comes right back and says, but, but. And in fact, I, it'd be interesting to hear Sandra talk about that distinction between the, the Ruslander and Katya's novel titles. One comment on Al Reimer, the Canadier, returning to tell this story and then criticizing it theologically. Uh, in a collection of essays called uh, Why I Am a Mennonite, oh, Why I Am a Mennonite, he published a, a short essay called Coming In Out of the Cold. In it, he describes his experience growing up and having absolutely no interest in his Mennonite past, finding it dreadfully boring and wanting nothing to do with it. Then in a trip he took, like many of you have, to Ukraine, he describes feeling this, um, I want to say like euphoric or a eureka moment, I'm not sure what the word he uses, but just having this, what he calls the ethnic identity, kind of slammed into him. And it was only after that experience that he said maybe there's something of worth in this Mennonite history, and he began to pull more research into the history of its whole and began to consider his own role as a Mennonite. <clears throat> Excuse me. Interestingly, he calls, he says, he recognizes that he's not a Ruslander. This is not his story. And that he says, it's the tragic curve of all Mennonites. I thought that was interesting. This idea that this individual, very specific story becomes adopted by Canadians. And I think in, in the larger body of literature, it's done the same thing. It's become such an important story that it's bled over its, uh, 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 its very specifics into a larger communal discussion. But that's not to say it's not... Uh, problematic, as the Ruslander would, I think, remind us. And in fact, that's my background as well, as the Canadian tradition. Uh, and uh, when I started to uh, read, well, actually, I came to Guelph with a totally different project. I was going to be doing historical fiction in Canada. Finally, around my second year, my advisor, Samaro, said, okay, fine, all you're doing is reading Mennonite novels <laughs> anyways. Why don't you just do something about that? And at that time, it was, uh, I had just read for the first time Blue Mountains of China. And then I came across Rudy Weeb's Sweeter Than All the World. And then I came across uh, Sandra Birdsville's uh, Children of the Day. And I thought, well, what's, what's going on here? What is, why do so many novels return to this history? Uh, and, I focused, and that's why I focused on it from a dissertation. We need to tell our authors, they need to start telling that Canadian migration story uh, so we can follow that as well. Thank you for that. Any questions? Please. Behind his wife and children, I'm still in the 
Yes, yeah, that's right. I took part in the Marks and Washington test. So I was there on the ground and all those 100,000, 200,000 people. So I was there, and Martin Luther King gave his speech. There's Jacob Randolph up there, all these people I knew about. When I was asked to do a talk about it about a year ago, I went to the archives and found out what I didn't know. Hmm. So Jackie Robinson was there. I didn't know that. All of these things, people were there, you know, on the ground, along with ordinary, so called ordinary people, you know. Hmm. And to me, that was a revelation. Hmm. And now, as I begin to start, try to tell my own story out there, I have these fixed points yes. that I can go to thanks to the internet. You know? Thank whoever, whatever God there be for the internet. Yeah, no, you're welcome. I think one of the great services that's being done by these authors, even though a lot of them are critical of some of the history that they record, is this discussion that they're creating. And this is why I think it's such a fascinating to read across these texts, the type of communal discussion that keeps these histories alive that, uh, I mean, frankly, I, would, I certainly wouldn't know anything of it. I grew up in Winkler, and I still had no idea about any of this. Thank you. Yeah, please. Are you able to give a an estimate, at least, of how many of the uh, authors, Mennonite authors, are, are starting off, at least, uh, with a very critical negative uh, experience within the Mennonite community versus those who are coming up with more positive, and whether or not that reflects in their initial writings. Hmm. Well, I'm going to... Stray, stay away from the biographies here. Uh, I can't speak to... I'm asking you generally. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I know. <laughs> I feel that. I see that. Um, you know, for me, it's, it's, it's um, always more interesting to see the shape of the critiques that happen. Uh, I think it's well documented, uh, both anecdotally and by the critics uh, that we have in Canada, that there certainly is a strong tradition, critical tradition, and I mean critical in the sense of negative, uh, in many of Canadian writers. But I don't think um, we should be too quick to accept that as always a rejection. Uh, these texts, you return to it not, I mean maybe you return to it sometimes because you're so angry, but a lot of the novels that return to this history are not in that vein. Uh, there is criticism, political criticism, uh, often uh, economic criticisms, but I think these are the same critiques, frankly, that our historians have made. And uh, returning to these narratives, I don't know if the process of returning to the, these particular narratives uh, has made some of our authors more sympathetic. I mean, the Al Reimer story going to the, to, uh, to the colonies made him suddenly value this in a way that he had dismissed in the past, for example. But it certainly changes the way that we as a community look at our authors. Um, when Sandra Birdsell wrote in 2001, she was at a meeting, this is from her talk that she gave here, she says she was at a reading at the Steinbeck uh, Heritage uh, Village uh, where she did a reading with Rudy Weeb. <clears throat> and afterwards she came out and Rudy said to her, oh, so Sandra, you've become a Mennonite. And I think there's a sense in which we as a community are, uh, are asking, uh, we respond to our authors in the same way. We, when they tell our stories, we are, of course, interested but also uh, sensitive. It's interesting, though, that this bleeds out, of course, beyond the community as well. It's not only Mennonites who are reading Mennonite literature, as we have evidence tonight. <laughs> uh, and in fact, if you step outside this sort of uh, echo, not echo trip, the, the small community of people in the Mennonite critical traditions who are talking about these uh, issues very intelligently and, and cogently, there are other people talking about these same issues with the Mennonite stories. And I think it's quite interesting. One example of that is Myrna Kostash in her uh, her uh, collection of essays, she's a Ukrainian Canadian, and in her collection of essays, The Doomed Bridegroom, she has a chapter, uh, the name is escaping me. It was also published, I think, in one of our uh, Mennonite journals. Anyways, and she, she posits this sort of ongoing conversation with an unnamed, uh, unnamed Mennonite poet who shall remain nameless. Uh, and in it, she says, I had no idea who you were until I read your novels. And then, to my shock and my horror, you were the bully down the street. You were the boy who did this. You were this, you were this. And she talks about the way in which she didn't have any idea of the Mennonite history until she started to read Mennonite literature in Canada. And what's interesting to me is that she pulls ch chunks here and there out of, uh, out of Lost in the Step, out of Al Reimer's novel, out of a few other novels, and just plots them in her narrative as if they're history, and then 
fights with them and debates with them. Uh, and it's fascinating. And, and so there's other examples as well, another collection of uh, essays on it by a Ukrainian woman whose name is escaping me. It also offers a reading of some of these Mennonite novels. And so of course, just as uh, the Commonwealth didn't exist out of context, so too the today's uh, narratives about this story don't exist out of context, right? There are other people who are implicated in these stories and who are listening as well. Uh, uh, Myrna Kostash, her name is. She's a Canadian poet, Kostash, K-O-T-S-C-H? Yeah, yeah, K-O, oh sorry, K-O-S-T-A-A-S-H? Yeah, so it's really, she's a remarkable writer, actually. I'd like to push you out on that. Um, it's no surprise that the, that the rear is doing our own story. Mm -hmm. What is the intrigue of the other people? Society, that large, the leaders of the world. What's the bad Well, there's a short answer and a long answer, I think. <laughs> the short answer, uh, is that it's really good writing. Uh, the community has been blessed for whatever reason, and there's a few arguments for it, with just a number of remarkable authors. Uh, and lots of people have no interest in the Mennonites, but they are interested in what Rudy Weeb has to say, or Sandra Birdsell, or the other, other authors. So that's the short answer, is that people who are interested in good literature find themselves unable to avoid Mennonite literature in Canada. The long answer, which I will try and give you the short version, is much more speculative, and I, I have a few arguments for it in the larger project, but I think when you historicize the emergence of Mennonite writing in Canada, it came into its own at a time when the official discourse of Canadian cult, culture and politics was changing. It came into a time when the Royal Commission on Biculturalism and Bilingualism said, we need to, and this is the name of one of the books, uh, pay attention to the cultural contribution of other ethnic groups. And so in the 70s when novels or a collection like Harvest, the first anthology of Mennonite writing was published, it was published alongside oh, just a host of other quote unquote first ethnic uh, anthologies, black Canadian, Asian Canadian, Jewish Canadian, Greek Canadian, all these novels came, or collections of anthologies came out at the same time, responding to a new environment when these stories are suddenly valued uh, and when the federal government put money behind it, frankly. So that context, that idea of multicultural Canada and looking for cultural documents that support this vision of ourselves is the context in which Mennonite writing circulates in Canada, or has circulated. And Mennonite writing, first of all, it's very productive and it's very strong writing, uh, but it plays a particular role in that history and uh, there's work to be done to ask what is it about Mennonite writing that is so uh, accessible within that discourse of multicultural Canada that maybe some other uh, communities are, are, uh, are not. And there's some people have offered answers and usually they run along the line of, it's a, ethnic difference is a, is a safer form of distance than say, uh, racialized difference. And Mennonites in Canada have been so successful, they're in some ways assimilated, in other ways uh, representative of a sort of a, one critic says, a safe difference. Uh, and so I think in many ways the writing is fantastic, but it's also had the, ridden the wave of a critical and political context in which it emerged. And interestingly, this is not the case in the States where the uh, Mennonite tradition of writing is not taken as an ethnic writing. It's really just, I think Julia Kasdorf has mentioned at one point, she says it's just another Christian group clamoring for attention. And so it'll be fascinating to hear what she has to say about this next, uh, next Friday uh, because I'll be very interested because some of these novels in the States have become huge. There's this tradition of Amish uh, uh, romance novels that are best sellers in the States. And I mean, I, you have to ask her what's going on there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right, the bonnet rippers. <laughs> yes? I'm curious as to whether part of the appeal of some men that I write is that not only does it have interesting ways of treating theology theology in the community or on individuals, but certain aspects of theology, namely mystical, let's call it, experience, hmm. or encounter with heroes of faith that inspire us, or hurt us, or whatever. And is there an element of what you might even call the, the kind of mix of realism and, and mythological around the psycho-spiritual experience of persons in community? Hmm. I don't know if any of this makes any sense, hmm. except to say that 
in strange ways, I feel hypercritical about my faith roots and drawn to them in yeah. terms of a personal encounter mm -hmm. with all that partly identifies that theological element. And I'm wondering if you can speak to that. Um, not in specifics. Uh, you're right to say that many of these novels, at the very least, you, you would think that they'd all would need to engage with the relig religious and theological traditions. And Lost, in this step, is the odd man out in that regard. Most of them do. As indeed do most Mennonite, quote unquote, Mennonite novels. Uh, so even something like A Complicated Kindness, once you start to push on it, yes, it's very critical. But there's also something else going on that's really interesting, right? And much more productive, I think. Uh, I don't know what to say about that, except to say that the critical discourse in Canada has no way of talking about religious novels. Uh, religion, in Canadian literary criticism at least, is completely racialized. So <clears throat> Islam, Muslim stories, for example, are not about religion. They're about racial difference. And Mennonites, in that sense as well, because of, the, I think, the tradition of multicultural criticism and, and literature in Canada has been taken up under the guise of ethnic fiction. And so in many ways, the sort of theology that's implicit in it, that you're locating there, uh, it goes, I want to say unnoticed. It's not unnoticed, but it's understood as evidence of, of some sort of cultural distinctiveness as opposed to really wrestling with theological and larger issues. And you may be right that one of the things that people find attractive is literature that takes seriously uh, the theological and religious arena, which frankly, um, there just isn't that discussion in the larger critical community. That's interesting. Hmm. Well, thank you all very much. Thanks, Rob, for this too. Your Absolute pleasure. <laughs> Yes.